There is no one in the world whose name is as synonymous with the social determinants of health as is Sir Michael Rudder. It is his work that has put these issues on the radar screen, both within Britain and globally. Sir Michael's original work with uh, Japanese immigrants has uh, uh, expanded analyses of Whitehall I studies and then Whitehall II showed the direct gradient of social environments and cardiovascular risk. It showed that the control over one's life directly relates to the life that you have. And that work has expanded, and his current work is leading the way again, demonstrating what can and should be done to narrow the unjust disparities in health, and in so doing, reduce the social disparities and improve social justice. I'm not going to read Sir Michael's extensive biography. I would say simply that uh, he is MRC Research Professor of Epidemiology and Public Health at the University College of London. And there, the tagline, I think, is so applicable to what we are doing today. Reducing health inequalities through action on the social determinants of health. That is our goal. Reducing inequalities through action. Sir Michael, Thank you very much for joining us. It's a great pleasure to be here. People have been asking me, what's a young person like me doing with a walking stick? It is linked to urban health. I've been saying, boasting even, that cycling is good for the planet, it's equitable, and it's good for health, mostly. <laughs> I had a bicycle accident and fractured my femur. Uh, the circumstances were slightly unusual. I was cycling home after a rather posh dinner at the Royal College of Physicians and I was wearing my tuxedo and black tie and came off. When the ambulance man saw me lying in the road in my tuxedo, he said, he's at a few. <laughs> I have not, I protested. He's at a few, said the ambulance man. And then I thought, where are we going? Is he going to say, as one conservative member of parliament said, if people have lifestyle diseases, perhaps they should pay for the cost of their treatment? I thought, good heavens, I'm lying there in agony, is this where our health service is going? Is he going to say, well, it was caused by alcohol? It wasn't. I the president of the Royal College of Physicians wrote to me, he was very distressed, and he said, I hope we weren't in some way responsible. As you know, these doctors are rather proud of the wine they serve. And I hasten to add that the wine was excellent, but I only had one glass of it. The, the, ambulance, the woman who was the, the pair, she said to me, on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate your pain? You know, the, you know we probably designed that questionnaire. Um, <laughs> how would you rate your pain? And I said, 12. At the worst bit, the worst bit, they get me into the back of the ambulance. Joke number 23 in our reading group, 
you know, that's the first joke. We tell them by numbers because we've been meeting for 35 years. And joke number 23 is this old man has an accident and he's put in the back of the ambulance and the ambulance man says, are you comfortable? He says, I make a living. <laughs> so I was waking, waiting for the ambulance man to say, are you comfortable? And he didn't say it. Anyway, I'm pleased that I'm here to tell the tale, and I'm very grateful to our National Health Service for the excellent care that I got. That's a plug, by the way. That's a plug. <laughs> As I hope you know, in 2008, we published the report of the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health, and we called it Closing the Gap in a Generation. What a remarkable idea. We pointed to 44 years spread in life expectancy across the world. Life expectancy for women in Zimbabwe was 42, and for women in Japan was 86. We talked about the fact that in Afghanistan, one in eight women will die during her life from a maternal-related cause whereas in the better part of Europe, it's one in 46,500. And we wanted to close the gap in a generation. It was a statement that we have the knowledge to close the gap in a generation. It was a statement that we have the means to close the gap in a generation. The question is, do we have the will? And in the light of the WHO Commission, I was invited by the government in Britain to conduct a review to ask how could we translate the findings of the Global Commission into a form that was applicable to one country, England. And I called my report Fair Society, Healthy Lives. It was a rather grand claim. The claim was that if we put fairness at the heart of all policy making, health would improve and health inequalities would diminish. I'm a bit regretful that I gave it that title. For reasons that I can't defend or explain, I spent a year as president of the British Medical Association, and they explained to me that the president was supposed to be above the political fray, not to engage in the day-to-day -day politics. And I was giving a talk about my reported at the World Medical Association, and I expressed this regret that we gave it the title Fair Society, Healthy Lives, because I said the government in Britain today uses the word fairness as if it has no meaning at all. They lower taxes for the rich, and they say it's fair. They cut tax credits for the poor, and they say it's fair. They cut benefits for the poor, and they call that fair. I said, it's a grotesque parody of fairness. And the chairman of council of the British Medical Association came up to me and said, thank goodness you're not political. <laughs> Next week, the British Medical Journal had in the front of the news section, BMA president labels government policy grotesque parody of fairness. Well, I'm not political, but as I'll say later, I think a main task that we have, who have the luxury to be independent as academics, is indeed talking truth to power. I was invited by the regional director of WHO Europe to conduct a review of social determinants of health and the health divide in the WHO European region. Europe, in the WHO parlance, is a movable feast. It includes the whole of the former Soviet Union. So it stretches right to the Bering Strait. You can just about touch Sarah Palin from the... Uh, <laughs> happily, it stops short of that. Um, with the WHO Commission, we said the key principle, and I've carried this through into my two other reviews, was one of social justice. We rejected the idea that one should take action on health inequalities somehow for instrumental reasons, because it might improve the economy. It might, 
but that's not why we're doing it. We're doing it because avoidable health inequalities are wrong. And we put empowerment at the center of what we're trying to achieve, material, psychosocial, and political. We said we wanted to create the conditions for people to have control of their lives. I want to talk for the rest of this talk a little bit about my English review, but more about the European review. And I'll nod to how that might have applicability to the US. So in the English review and in the European review, building on the WHO review, we took a life course approach. We said, if you want to reduce health inequalities, you've got to start prenatally, preschool, and then school, training, employment, and retirement. And a key theme was the social gradient. <clears throat> the provost this morning talked about the 20 year gap in life expectancy between the poorest part of Baltimore and the richest part. And we have similar gaps in the UK. But what this shows is the social gradient. Uh, local authorities here are classified by degree of deprivation. On the right-hand end, we've got the most affluent, and the left-hand end, thank you. So we've got the most affluent here and the most deprived there. And what you can see is the social gradient. It's not simply the case that the poor have shorter lives than the rich. You can see that people near the top have shorter life expectancy than those at the top. People in the middle have shorter life expectancy than those near the top. The implications of that, I would argue, are quite profound. No one in Britain is poor on a global scale. Globally, 40% of the world's population live on $2 a day or less. No one in Britain, no one in the United States lives on $2 a day or less. We're all fantastically wealthy. So you'd say, what's the problem? We have poverty, as I'll show you, in our own terms, which is profound and has profound impact on health and length of life. So it's not just poverty in absolute terms, in the sense of destitution. It's relative poverty in the sense of what you're able to do in the context of the society. And the fact that we've got this social gradient means we have to take action across the whole of society, not focus only on the poorest. And within local authorities, we published my English review in 2010, and on the one-year anniversary, 2011, and the two-year anniversary, 2012, and we'll do it again next year, 2014, we monitored what was going on. So this was part of the monitoring report, so we could keep track of what was going on. And within local authorities, the London Borough of Westminster is where the Houses of Parliament are. And I can, well, at least I could, cycle from the Houses of Parliament to the north of the borough in about half an hour, and that's a 17-year gap in male life expectancy. So MPs could come out of the Parliament and go for a walk and cover a 17-year gap in male life expectancy. In Hackney, in East London, uh, they came to me and said, we wish you hadn't just published the inequalities because we look really good. They look really good because it's uniformly awful in Hackney. Uh, there's not that much disparity because it's all down there near the bottom. So we've got to look both at the average and at the slope index of inequality. And we have similar differences for women. The six domains of recommendations in my English review were give every child the best start in life, enable all children, young people, and adults to maximize their capabilities, education and lifelong education, fair employment and good work for all, a minimum standard, minimum income standard for healthy living. Really radical that in a rich society. Everybody should have the minimum necessary for a healthy life. Healthy and sustainable places and communities 
and strengthen the role and impact of ill health prevention, looking at the causes of the causes. Moving into Europe where we adapted those recommendations, this is the remarkable scale of male life expectancy in Europe, 63 in the Russian Federation, Kazakhstan, Belarus, 80 in Israel, Iceland, Sweden, Switzerland. Sorry, this is hard to read. Um, if you look at these countries, the US would be down around here. So about half of the European countries have longer life expectancy, and European includes Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan and Moldova and um, includes going off to Alaska. Uh, about half of countries in the European region have better life expectancy than the United States. And we have a similar gradient for women but the magnitude is 12 years rather than 17 year difference. We should look not just at length of life, but quality of life. And this is women, um, life lived without disability and the paler part is with disability. So in fact, for some countries, women, although women have longer life expectancy than men, uh, for some countries, women live more years in disability than men do. So it's important to look not only at length of life, but at quality of life. Looking at inequalities within countries, Johan Mackenbach has looked at the slope index of inequality. That's a way of measuring the, the absolute differences along the gradient and looking at top and bottom as a way of measuring it. There's the European average. The countries, the newer member states of the European Union, Slovenia, Czech Republic, Poland, Estonia, Lithuania, Hungary, all have bigger health inequalities than do the older member states. And Sweden is up here uh, predictably fairly low. But even in Sweden, this is female life expectancy, 91 to 95, 2006 to 2010, 3.2 year gap increasing to a 4.1 year gap. Male life expectancy increasing from five years to six years. And there's an important message here. One famous economist said at an international meeting at which I was not present, he said, Michael Marmot would like the rich to have poorer health in order to reduce inequalities. I'm not very legalistic, but I thought that was outrageous because I never said that that particular economist has read my book, Status Syndrome, where I say the opposite. We have two societal goals. One is to improve health for everybody. And the second is to narrow the gap. So in Sweden, they're improving health for everybody, but they're not narrowing the gap. One societal goal is being met, the other is not. More work to be done. And many countries look just like Sweden. In Russia, looking at life expectancy, probability of living to 65 when age 20, going down for those with less than secondary education, going up for those with university education. So the gap is increasing dramatically. This is the framework for our recommendations in the European Review, to look at life course stages at the wider society at macro level context and its systems. Now, I'll give you a flavor of it. We said that early child care and education is important, as we did in the English Review and the Global Commission Report. PISA scores, PISA is the Program of International Student Assessment. 
And it's looking at the difference in PISA scores. So these are young people being assessed at ages 15 and 16 on maths and literacy and science knowledge. And it's looking at the difference in PISA scores by attending preschool for more than one year. So in all of these countries, children who attended preschool for more than one year had better educational performance at age 15 and 16, even after accounting for socioeconomic background. In these countries, um, socioeconomic background makes a bigger difference to whether or not you attended preschool, but even so, children who attended preschool have better educational performance at age 15 or 16 than those who did not. And of course, educational performance of 15 and 16 is a potent predictor of the kind of job you'll have, if you'll have a job at all, the kind of income you'll earn, where you'll live, and then in turn on health and health inequalities. Child poverty rates across Europe. Child poverty is measured as less than 60% median income. So given what I said earlier about poverty, this is not destitution in the, w, in the World Bank sense of $2 or $1.25 a day. This is relative to the standard in each country. Compare, for example, Latvia. We've, I'm learning. Um, compare Latvia. Child poverty in Latvia before taxes and transfers is about 35%. In Sweden, up here, before taxes and transfers, it's about 32%. After taxes and transfers, child poverty in Latvia is still 25%, but in Sweden, it's about 12%. The UK, regrettably, is a bit closer to Latvia than it is to Sweden. The United States looks a lot like Latvia. You have elected not to use taxes and transfers to reduce child poverty. You, as a society, have made a decision that child poverty is what you want. I can only assume that's the case. Otherwise, you would do what European countries are doing and use taxes and transfers to reduce child poverty. Child poverty is not given by God or Darwin or wherever you think this stuff comes from. It's a political decision. How do you want to operate your fiscal system? Do you want low child poverty or do you want high child poverty? You and Latvia have made decision you want high child poverty. That's a shame. And so when we look at inequalities or equality in child well-being, material conditions, education and health, the most equal Denmark, Finland, Netherlands, and Switzerland. That's interesting in the European context. The Minister of Health from one country, which I don't think I should name, but it was the Netherlands, <laughs> said to me, I don't think WHO should be doing this social determinants garbage. Health is a matter of personal responsibility. People should know they need to look after themselves and if they're sick, get health care and not smoke and be responsible. Forget social determinants. And I looked at her and said, don't blame the children. They didn't choose to be poor. They didn't choose their parents. Are you blaming the children? The Netherlands has the most equitable child conditions. You want to pull the ladder up after you? Why shouldn't the rest of Europe try and achieve what you have in the Netherlands? This is not a matter simply of personal responsibility. We have to create the conditions for our children to flourish. And I feel ashamed 
that we're way down here. And I'm very grateful to the United States because you're even worse than we are. And the latest UNICEF figures, Report Card 13, which was published two weeks ago, country comparisons on average rank in four dimensions of child well-being, material, health, education, and behaviors and risks. The UK ranked 20 in the early 2000s, and the United States was equal, bottom. You're now bottom in splendid isolation. We've moved up um, to 16. But that's where we want to be in terms of equality in child conditions. Who's against? Who's against improving conditions for children? I started when I talked about the Global Commission, the WHO Commission. I said, do we have the knowledge? We have the knowledge. Do we have the means? We have the means. Do we have the will? And as part of our monitoring report, following my English review, we looked at child well-being, a child um, achieving a good level of development at age five by local authority, local area of England. And again, the more affluent, the, the more children that achieve a good level of child development at age five, the more deprived, the fewer. And I was presenting these data in the parliament, in the British parliament, and one sportsman said, oh, I think the multiple R squared on that would be a bit low. And I thought, that's just what politicians want to hear, to discuss multiple R squared. Um, there is an important point. There's a very clear gradient. The more affluent, the better the child development. But there's variation around the line. For a given level of affluence and deprivation, some communities are doing better than others. Very important. One way to reduce the inequalities in early child development is to reduce the economic inequalities in society. A second way is to become, for a given level of affluence and deprivation, to become one of these communities up here. I was talking in...